Hello, I'm Peter Higgins, and I have the privilege of introducing Michael Kane, who's one of the founders of Our Medicine, who served on the organizing committee for the past four years, who is a assistant professor at the Yale School of Public Health in the Biostatistics Department, who's interested in scalable statistics. And today we'll be presenting on collaborative reproducible exploration of clinical trial data. All right. Thanks, Peter. Um, all right. So, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about a, it's a kind of two different things, uh, but that are uh, pretty par parallel. So with a lot of the work that I do, I, I, um, I research methods, uh, but I do a lot of work with clinicians. And so, um, and I do a lot of uh, data analyses around atom formatted data sets or clinical trial data. Uh, a lot of times that clinical trial data is after the trial is complete and either people want to be able to, they want to look at a lot of times it's uh, population heterogeneity. So what, what were the different profiles for the individuals in the trial? Or it's for, um, uh, or a lot of times they also want to see what happened when a trial goes bad or why did it go bad. Um, this talk is going to be specifically about the exploration part, part portion of the, um, of the analyses that, that, uh, that I present, mostly because I've been uh, building tools with a couple of other people and, uh, you know, we're kind of up through the exploration part, um, and that's kind of one, I think, one of the more interesting parts. Um, so this talk is going to be about a couple of different things. So it's how do I think about my relationship with the, with my clinical uh, collaborator? Essentially, what do I, what is my role, uh, and what is their role, and you know, how do we, uh, how do we, uh, how does understanding that role help to get to better results? Um, how do I present results? Uh, again, the tools that I'm going to be showing are mostly for atom formatted data sets or something close. So we're dealing with clinical data. Um, usually it's order tens to hundreds of different variables. Uh, so basically, how do, we, how do we provide something that's a pretty comprehensive view that's going to be consumable both by a statistician who's generating these things um, and the clinician? At the same time, I want to be able to do this without spending all my time or hours and hours creating, uh, um, creating visualizations and tables. Uh, in our markdown, and this is where we really we get to the, kind of the tools that are available, including the ones that I'm going to be presenting, um, and how are they used for this for for these types of collaborations. So I want to present not only the tools but the context in which uh, I'm uh, I'm using them. Um, so uh, so I tend to be kind of the the technical lead with for for a lot of these analyses. Sometimes I have somebody who's a who's an analyst uh, who will run things for me. A lot of times I'm doing these things myself. Um, you know, one of the things to realize with the clinician is that a lot of times it's, if you don't, that your, your goal is to really be a partner with them uh, uh, in, in the investigation. And the idea is, you know, if you don't manage that part of, you know, that part of the collaboration, you will probably be managed by the clinician. You know, clinicians are busy. They tend to be really good in, uh, at organization and research. And if you're not going to be able to, if, if you have trouble showing uh, or providing value quickly, you're gonna, probably going to get tasks with things that, 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 that are going to help them with that. So specifically, I think usually think of my job as a statistician is to print, prevent, or sorry, present all of the relevant data and their basic relationships. And again, this is at the exploratory portion. So you know, usually there is an idea of some hypothesis, but you we usually go through the exploratory port portion, which is after we clean the data, just to make sure that the data look like you know like we expect. Make sure there was no problems with the cleaning, um, and then to evaluate the hypothesis and see if we have other uh, there there are other interesting hypotheses. Um, then my job a lot of times is to create a well-posed hypothesis. And by well-posed, I mean that I want to be able to create a data that I can answer by statistical means uh, 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 with the data that's being, present, uh, that, that, that's being presented. So, um, you know, some clin clinicians vary in terms of the amount of st uh, statistical background they have. Uh, sometimes they have awesome intuition, but are not necessarily going to be able to tell you what the analysis is. Some other people are going to be able to su uh, suggest analyses, you know, all the way up through which uh, which statistical test uh, that they want to see. Um, so then after that, my job is to a lot of times then test the hypothesis, so execute whatever the analysis is, um, and then provide an interpretation of the results. So. Um, you know, in general, uh, clinicians usually know know at least enough statistics to be dangerous. Uh, at the same time, for me as a statistician, I should be thinking about learning at least enough clinical science to be dangerous. Uh, and the goal is to keep uh, the goal is to keep uh, each other out of danger and provide scientific insights by statistical means. Uh, so, 
you know, especially as we're thinking about the exploratory portion that, you know, the context that I'm doing a, a lot of these analysis is, 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 is research, right? So um, research is inherently kind of uh, inefficient in some ways, uh, but that doesn't mean all portions should be in, inefficient. Um, so the, uh, you know, from experience, the part that is kind of inefficient is can be uh, creating um, these well-posed hypotheses. Sometimes we have to iterate, sometimes we have to go back and forth with thinking about what those mean, and then also the interpretation of the results. Um, so those parts are the most researchy, and because of that, you know, I think, you know, we usually do accommodate a little more inefficiency. But the idea is for these other parts, you know, how do we minimize the amount of inefficiency so that we can really, you know, focus on uh, the scientific questions and then answering the scientific questions. Um, so again, part of the one of the questions we have here is how do we make the exploratory portion uh, more efficient? So we have kind of the classic data workflow, but I want to think about you know what do we need need along with that, or you know how do we go beyond that? So in general, what we really want to do is we want to system sy make systematic how we clean the data, um, how we communicate the summaries, and then how we navigate those summaries. So again, because we're I'm usually dealing with tens to hundreds of variables, um, there are enough there there are enough relationships there where that. I'm probably not gonna write all of the R Markdown code myself to create things like tables and visualizations. So if I have a large number of these tables and visualizations, then I wanna think about how do I get to the ones of interest uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and then another thing is that it, it's a really, it's a lot better when the clinician can, uh, can engage the kind of digital artifacts that you're creating. So, you know, Again, I'm usually focused on well-organized tables and visualizations, and after those are created, I usually end up putting those as HTML documents in a place where the clinician uh, can find them. And most of that is so you know those those are things that can be shared be shared before meetings, and those usually uh, end up being kind of the emphasis for the meetings that, that that I have with clinicians, especially when we're starting when we're thinking about what are the hypotheses that we want to uh, that that we want to test. So. Um, so going a little bit beyond this, this is this tends to be how I think of the the the, um, the, the, the workflow that we do for, uh, for 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 these collaborative relationships. Um, there's you know the state acquisition, processing, normalization, uh, processing and normalization, analysis, and then communicating the output. These are usually the output artifacts that that come out. But the thing to really remember about these is with each one of these things, there's there's this there's usually the evaluation of, of the output artifacts and usually that means going back and doing some kind of exploration of the results um, you know with uh, visualization and analyses so we really want to think about how do we capture those artifacts and how do we make sure that everyone knows about them and that they're incorporated into um, into the research process process and any of the decisions that we're making so this uh, so this um, is kind of a classic waterfall model. So in software engineering, there's this concept of waterfall um, for for the construction of software. This is kind of this is a waterfall for the construction of um, these analyses and and the artifacts that uh, that, that that present them. Um, and I just wanted to say, and yeah, one other thing is that you can have more than one analysis. You know, so in that case, you do have kind of these other tributaries that are coming off of the waterfall. But the idea with the waterfall is that that um, anything that's downstream usually depends on at least uh, uh, depends on everything upstream. Um, so this does go towards this idea of when we're cleaning data, we actually a lot of times want to make sure that if we're changing data, we want to change it as far upstream as we can, and we can uh, just so that. Uh, you know, if we're thinking about a workflow that we can allow, you know, any of those changes to cascade forward into the analyses um, and other artifacts that we create. All right. So I'm going to just show this is one example. I'm not going to show this one. There, I'm going to show an example of the type of of the type of uh, visualizations that we end up showing. So I'm going to get out of full screen. Um, so this is one that we did a little while ago. This is for, um, it was a KRAS study. So if you go to Project Datasphere, uh, you can find actually both treatment and control data for uh, Fall Fox and Fall Fury. Um, these were these are the, the, the types of analyses that we end up doing. Again, and most of the time it's, you know, to begin with, it's table. Um, you know, lately we've been adding a, a, a tab beforehand that goes through kind of the, that tells something about the data cleaning process. A lot of times that in includes something like a, a, a consort diagram to see, you know, 
how many patients do we expect to have? How many uh, how many samples of the data are we dropping? Um, and then what uh, what did the data look like? And then after that, we have you know again this data review. This th this particular analysis was based around um, subtyping, so we were looking at uh, what are the what are the what are what are the patient profiles associated with response or non-response, um, along with kind of these uh, these other visualizations. So again, the idea is we have a lot of artifacts that we want to that, that we want to present, and um, we don't want to have to create all these R markdown documents per tab by ourselves. Um, and so we want to kind of automate the process of generating them, um, and then also present them in a way that's uh, that that's that's navigable. All right, so. How do we do this? So the packages that I'm going to show today, um, again, there are three of them. So one is uh, forceps, and basically the idea is you can take a data frame and you can assign uh, uh, roles. So this is th this is taking from uh, the the tidy models uh, nomenclature and tidy models. They have a notion of roles as being a dependent or independent variable. I want to generalize that a little bit so that we have. Uh, so that we can declare our own roles and then start thinking about uh, combinations of uh, relationships between variables in the role, which is going to be handled by this variate package. Um, and then I'm going to use uh, another package called listdown uh, that's, um, uh, so listdown is used then to, to take those artifacts and organize them and present them uh, in, uh, using HTML. All three of these packages are on GitHub. Um, uh, my my handle is Kane plus uh, plus, and then it's the package. List down is on Cran right now. It's a slightly earlier version, um, uh, and yeah. So I'm going to be showing some of the some of the newer functionality. So um, I'm just going to start with this example, and so this is uh, so I'm going to so the forceps package includes a couple of data sets. So there's an ADSL data set, biomarker, um, adverse event, and demography. Uh, these are going to be pretty pretty closely modeled after some of these things that uh, some of the, some of the da data sets you see that are usually atom formatted. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, import those. I'm going to do a little bit of processing on them. Um, one thing I am going to do is the adverse event data is longitudinal. The other data sets are not. So I'm going to use this cohort variable, which is basically going to say um, by subject ID if the other variables are repeated for a subject ID, then just collapse that variable to a single row. If you can't collapse that variable to a single row, then put it in its own tibble that we're going to use as another column in the data set. So if you want to look at what that looks like, I have this data list. The adverse events tibble is, again, this collapsed version of this data set. So if I say adverse event, uh, yeah, so if I say data list adverse events, and I look at the beginning of this, you can see I have the subject ID. There's an uh, adverse event count. Um, and then all the other variables, which are again longitudinal, uh, are, are uh, embedded in a, in a tibble. Um, so after I have those those data those data sets put together, then what I'll do is um, I'll consolidate on the uh, on, on the subject ID. So this is going to do an outer join of those um, of those four uh, tibbles. It's going to do a little bit extra because uh, we want to just check for name collisions and uh, do a, a couple of other checks to make sure that the data look okay. Uh, but once we have that, we have kind of this, this nice uh, tidy data set. Um, and again, the adverse events, which is this longitudinal data set, is, uh, is, is stored as a list. So if we need something else from the adverse event, like just a single feature, we can use um, some of the we can use the map functions on those to grab the feature. If we need to change the format of the data so that it includes the adverse events, so for something like a longitudinal analysis, we can unnest on the adverse events, selecting only the columns that we need. And then we can even think about, you know, if if um, this is right now, uh, each row corresponds to a single patient. If we wanted to change that so that it's site ID, for example, then we could nest on site ID and start thinking about what are what, what are the characteristics of the, of the different sites. So now that I have that data set, what I'm going to do is assign roles to it. So all I'm doing here is I'm creating a list. Um, the name for the names for the list are the role names. So I'm going to say that baseline is going to be the variables uh, in demography and biomarkers minus the subject ID and the site ID. Um, so in that case, then baseline is going to refer to a set of variables in uh, in the tibble. I'm going to do the same thing for uh, for the other ones. And once I have this roles list put together, then I'm going to add these roles to um, uh, to my tibble. Now the roles are going to be stored as an attribute, which means that you, X is still going to be a regular tibble that you can do all of your 
tibbly things with. Um, but it has this extra information that's going to allow us to do a couple of other things. So if you want to see what the roles are per variable, you can just call role, roles of x, and you can see what's the term. So that's the variable. Uh, the role is the role that was assigned. And then I'm just going to keep track of what, th what, what the type is. Um, now that I have those things, I can start thinking about doing uh, operations based on roles. So one of the things I could do is I could use GT summary, and I could say, I'm going to take x grab the everything that was uh, all the variables in the administration role, which was only uh, the site ID. And then I'm going to also keep arm. So that's going to grab just these the admin ver admin role variables along with arm. And then I can pipe that to table summary, for example. And I get something like this. So rather than actually needing to select each of the variables that I need, I'll just select them by the role. The other thing that I can do is create perspectives. So perspective is either a table or a visualization summarizing possibly conditional univariate or bivariate relationships. Um, it's characterized by a formula and a data frame, and the vari variate package provides basically reasonable defaults. So, basic, so the idea is going to be that I'm going to have, um, I want to show relationships between variables within roles, uh, and I want to create a lot of those visualizations. Um, so this is uh, so the the uh, yeah so those visualizations are um, it's this is an extensible package so if you don't like any of the any of the perspectives so the the visualizations or tables that that, that are being generated you can override them yourself or yourself we basically tried to come up with a reasonable set of defaults um, so then if I want to create a perspective I can just take my x I'll push it through the perspective and I'll basically say my I want my y to be endpoints and my x to be arm. So the thing that's returned then is a is a tibble with the y terms corresponding to endpoints and uh, the x term uh, corresponding to arm. One of the things to note is I did make one of these roles uh, uh, survival uh, so that I'd be able to, to uh, visualize all of those. All right. So if I want to just look at one of these perspectives, I'll just call ps dollar sign perspective one, basically because I'm holding each one of these perspectives within a list. Um, so here's, uh, let's see, one was best response by arm, and I have a reasonable visualization for this. So again, a lot of this is for exploratory. I'm not as worried about these being publication ready. I just want something reasonable that I can go through and understand the data with pretty quickly. And then also that I can commoditize the, the generation of these. So if I wanted to take a look at all of these, I might want to push this through uh, Trelliscope. So I'll just select the uh, X and Y term, uh, yeah, my, Y term uh, in my X term and the perspective, um, and then push it through again Trelliscope JS, and I'll get this visualization. And this lets me scroll through each one of those visualizations, including the overall survival. Um, along with that, I can show uh, I can show more than one. Uh, I can show a couple. I can also add extra cognostics to this, so that if I want to prioritize which visualizations I want to see, then I can uh, I, I can do that, and then I can label uh, I can sort or filter based on those extra values, all right? Um, so then the last thing I want to do is show that, uh, the, the last thing I want to do is actually report these things. So we have now this nice kind of framework for, for showing relationships between roles. If we, need to, uh, if we need to make something a little more interactive, because we have a, a, a lot of visualizations that we can prioritize, we can put things into, um, uh, into, into Trelliscope, but now we want to structure these things. So I'm going to build a lot of these artifacts, a, a, a lot of these perspectives uh, in Trelliscope visualizations. Um, and then what I'm going to do is use ListDown to create my, my output document. So to actually do that, what I'll do is first describe the R Markdown structure with a list. So I'm going to have a list that's named that's going to point to my visualizations or pers perspectives or tables or whatever. I'm going to construct a, a, a tab uh, by um, basically giving list down this tab along with a little bit of extra information. And then I'm going to embed that tab in a web page that I'm generating. All right, so here's how I do this. So again, here's the uh, are these uh, what I call computational components. We have uh, baseline. So this is just going to be a single tab uh, with the baseline. And I'm going to have my tibble summary like I had before, um, my site count information where I'm going to be using my perspective, so admin uh, by arm. And then I'll just show the, the adverse events by arm as well. All right, so again, I'm, all I'm doing is creating a list and embedding uh, and having the list point to, the, uh, to, uh, to these objects. 
All right, after that, then what I'll do is I'll create a list down object, which tells me about how to actually render the document. So I'm gonna be using ggplot2 and gt summary to, to render the plot because those are the packages that were required, were required to, uh, to make those objects. Um, I don't want, uh, I want my R chunks, my R markdown chunks to not echo, uh, not show messages and not tell me any warnings. After that, I'm gonna just create a, a, a header um, and just to let it know that I want the document, uh, the table of contents to be true, and I, I do want it to be floating. After that, I'm going to create this Tibble tab um, by just bundling these three things. So this is the, uh, this LD bundle doc is uh, is a function that's supported by Listdown, and then I'm going to create this pages. So um, th which is going to be my uh, my uh, my, um, my web page, which is just going to be a single column called summary tables. And it's going to be using this uh, table tab uh, that I described before. Um, we still need a little bit more information, uh, so I'm just going to add the um, a, a little bit of YAML and tell it where to output. Um, and then here's the and and here's the result. So basically, I have this this baseline um, uh, table that I had before. I have the site counts. Uh, there's only the site ID perspective, and then for adverse events, there was only one. Uh, there was only the one AE. Uh, count perspective, uh, and I'm uh, and you know uh, and it's complete. So th this is a pretty extensible framework. There are a lot of other things that, where, that you can do to extend this or customize it. Um, there's definitely a couple of um, you know uh, there's definitely a lot more to this, um, but this is kind of the, a, the a quick example. At this point, I'm out of time, so I just wanted to say thanks to my collaborators Brian Hobbs and Austin Way. Uh, here are some of the packages that were being used, um, and thanks very much.